Welcome to 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue, one seat of world power. Rest assured, all of the people out here are under constant video monitoring somewhere. You know, it's sunny, it's hot uh, here outside the White House, but it's hard to get people to tell you how they feel about the spying that's going on. Some may be afraid to speak. Others say, I can't tell you anything because I'm on vacation, so I can't think about it while I'm on vacation. Others were much more clear about their opposition uh, to NSA spying. It's illegal. We have, we have rights to privacy, whether it be in public or on our computers or on our phones. The government doesn't have any right to, to spy on us. Uh, it needs to stop. And yes, yet they're doing it big time, aren't they? Yep. So you can't uh, you can't drive through a traffic light without having ten cameras watching you. I mean, do we not have some right to privacy even in in public? Uh, I think we do. I think we, I think our government's gone way left and uh, way socialist. I don't feel good about this. You know, there's a joke now that uh, says says the chancellor changed just her number of telephone. <laughs> <laughs> so the no, but without joke, it is not a good thing. One should know who are your friends and one should know who are not your friends. We're trying to get some people's reaction to the scandal about the NSA spying on people. If you're worried about it, concerned about it. Well, if you're not doing anything wrong, you should have nothing to hide. Do I mind if they listen in on my conversations? Not a bit, because I don't have anything to hide. Do you know that statement, you have nothing to fear, you have nothing to hide? The very statement, you have nothing to fear if you have nothing to hide, was a statement directly attributed to Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi minister of propaganda. The reality of America's surveillance state cannot be denied. It is very real and to critics very dangerous for the future of democracy. Not only are their protests uniting right and left, but satirists like the creators of Australia's Juice News deploy a rap attack on the surveillance state. Behold the latest weapon in the war of terror, our greatest invention since 9-11, guaranteed to keep us free and safe forever. I give you the surveillance state, ladies and generals. Our Secret wires log your key style Monitor every single number on your speed dial Rewind straight to your position with facial recognition And pinpoint you within .03 of a mile While some citizens fight back against more encroachments on privacy The NSA and its backers in the White House, Congress and the courts Are expanding their own reach Now monitoring literally trillions of messages And even using state-of-the-art facial recognition software NSA is also building facilities to store its data, like this top-secret $1.7 billion storage center in Utah, the size of 17 football fields. It will store yottabytes, the equivalent of 500 quintillion pages of text. The war on terror seems almost self-perpetuating, along with its insatiable need for endless surveillance, even as the surveillance state is being challenged as never before. There is a political battle over the future of NSA spying, with tactics escalating on all sides. In fact, mass U.S. surveillance goes back to our war on the Philippines in 1901, when it was used to identify critics and rebels. It had a strong racial component then, and critics say it still does, especially in spying on the Muslim community, even as that seems to have abated somewhat. The surveillance program was created 18 months after the 9-11 terror attacks. Its mission, to have undercover police officers collect information about Muslim and Middle Eastern communities, eavesdropping on mosques, businesses, and restaurants. While supporters argued it was a necessary anti-terror strategy, the program created under the watch of former police commissioner Ray Kelly outraged many Muslims who believed it was a violation of civil rights. What can stop the surveillance state? What about the courts? Adam Liptak covers the Supreme Court for the New York Times. 
The press had some great victories in the 60s and 70s, and that's basically in decline. And after 9-11, and with concerns about national security, the landscape for press freedom is not great, the legal landscape. So what can journalists do here? Do they, if they're trying to get information legitimately, the government doesn't want them to have it. Uh, that's a confrontation or a challenge. Uh, what do they do? Well, journalists can, can be tough and be brave and seek out information and publish it and unfortunately sometimes face the consequences. Lipfax speaks in terms of a balance between safeguards the government says it needs and the public's right to know. He admits his newspaper doesn't publish everything they know. There is on the one hand vast overclassification, sometimes to cover up government misdeeds or embarrassing episodes. On the other hand, there are the kinds of secrets that could really endanger the nation and finding the right line is not an easy thing. But, I mean, the New York Times published the Pentagon Papers. The New York Times is publishing, quote, the Snowden Papers. Does that make you proud, or do you have concerns about that? I'm not going to second-guess the judgment of the very good editors at the New York Times, but they are judgments, and we don't publish everything that comes into our possession. The press clearly feels constrained, so has embraced whistleblowers like Edward Snowden. Before Snowden sent NSA documents to reporters, he insisted they encrypt their emails to avoid being spied on. And he even made this video to show them how to do it. Okay, installation's completed. Let's start the program. You have two choices, Cleopatra or GPA for new privacy assistant. Uh, you want GPA. It's better in almost every way, even though it's older. Uh, this is the interface, uh, your keys. The first thing you need to do as a new user is go to preferences and click advanced mode. If you don't click this and it's not enabled by default, you won't be able to choose your key length. You want a key that is stronger than the default length. Andy Greenberg of Wired magazine says more and more reporters are encrypting for fear they're being spied on. I think that's often lost as we discuss the NSA's really incredible surveillance abilities is that they're not unlimited. There are ways to evade the, the NSA surveillance. As Snowden himself said, crypto works. Encryption software can prevent the government, the NSA, from spying on your communications. And so I think that that's created this, this new renaissance in, in encryption tools and anonymity programs that can actually mask or hide or um, create a kind of bubble of uh, privacy around your activities online. That still exists even in today's world of massive surveillance. Crypto may have helped, but it was Snowden's bold acts that captured media attention. He was at the time only 29, a high school dropout, ending up in a $122,000 a year job. He called himself Virex, Latin for truth teller, after using the code name True Hoo-Ha. It said he spent eight months plundering NSA secret files. The mass media is now all over the story. A survey of the LexisNexis database found NSA was mentioned only 675 times in all U.S. media in 2012. That number skyrocketed to 6,955 mentions in 2013. Earlier, media critics denounced the lack of NSA investigations by the press before Snowden's disclosures, and then meager media pickup of them afterwards. Today, there's been a renaissance of independent investigative reporting. Journalists close to Snowden, like Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras, launched their own publication, The Intercept, to expose government spying. It is funded by internet billionaire Pierre Omidyar. We'll give our journalists everything they need to do their jobs well. The freedom to travel, legal protection when they need it, new and innovative technology, and the rarest resource of all, the time and organizational backing to develop their skills. Umidiar is only one business leader now pushing publicly for restraints on NSA spying. Simple example is the National Security Agency allegedly collected the phone records of every phone call of 320 million people in order to identify roughly 300 people who might be at risk. That's just bad public policy. At the same time, civil liberties groups on the left and libertarians on the right have been pushing Congress to act because many, like the ACLU's Ben Wisner, see congressional oversight as a joke. I think fundamentally our concern is that surveillance technologies have developed so quickly uh, and democratic controls uh, have been much too slow. 
Uh, so that's true basically in our laws uh, that protect our privacy from surveillance, but it's also true in our oversight. Uh, I think the, that what we learned from the Snowden revelations um, is that those parts of our democracy that are supposed to do oversight over the executive branch uh, have failed miserably. Uh, that the Congress, that the, the, the intelligence committees that are supposed to rein in and oversee the, the surveillance state, in fact, do the opposite. They enable it in secret. Mr. Snowden hasn't lied to anyone. He did break his oath of office, but part of his oath of office is to the Constitution. And he believes that when James Clapper came in March, our national director of intelligence came and lied, that he was simply coming forward and telling the truth that your government was lying. And this is a big concern of mine because it makes me doubt the administration and their word to us when they come and talk to us because they have now admitted that they will lie to us if they think it's in the name of national security. Proposed new bills would make some necessary changes to a handful of surveillance laws, but not significantly narrow the NSA's powers granted by law and presidential directives. You know, the NSA has information now on every federal judge, on every member of Congress, on every other member of the executive branch. Uh, they may say it's just metadata, but this is the kind of information that could destroy any individual uh, if it were put to the wrong kind of use. Uh, so I think people have reason to, to, to be worried, you know, not that our form of government is going to change overnight, but that if we don't put in the right controls, uh, there are real threats to our way of life. While government spying is what's being debated now, private spying is also threatening. Uh, there are private companies ga gathering information about the political and, and uh, uh, protest activities of Americans on the streets of, of American neighborhoods across the country, and there's virtually no regulation of that activity. There's also a private surveillance industry, isn't there? Exactly. I mean, m with their own technologies and, you right. know, uh, and, and in many cases, you have international players like Israeli companies that are very right. active. Right, and, and you have an infrastructure built for it. So after 9-11, uh, the U.S. government helped fund the creation of what are called state and local lo intelligence fusion centers. And these fusion centers incorporate state and local law enforcement with federal law enforcement, often other state and local government entities like fire and emergency response, uh, sometimes even utilities. Uh, private companies and the military all together collecting information that's collected by the local police in your neighborhood as a way to funnel it up to the intelligence community. And then they have programs like what they call the Suspicious Activity Reporting Program, which sounds fine if something's suspicious, but they define what's suspicious and they say things like videotaping, photography, note-taking, drawing diagrams, in one case, in one program, espousing extreme views. If you see something, say something. Right. Isn't that the big slogan here in New York? Exactly. And what we've seen, only a, a relatively small number of these suspicious activity reports have been made public, but what we see is exactly what we warned they would be, that it's a, a proxy for racial profiling because what's being reported isn't suspicious. Former FBI agent Mike German doesn't dismiss fears of a police state because he too knows from the Snowden documents that NSA shares intelligence on Americans with the FBI, a domestic law enforcement agency. Because of my political websites, I was visited by the FBI, the United States Marshals, the Secret Service, the Department of Homeland Security, the United States Air Force, and some other people that I don't even know. And not always, sometimes they just approached me and wanted to know, uh, you know, what, you know, content about my websites, you know, uh, what certain things meant. Even if government surveillance is somehow restrained or curtailed, private surveillance is growing with new spy technologies now widely available in the consumer market. This is your family. Here's an ad from one company that sells surveillance in the name of personal security. And when you're not in the office, do you know what employees are doing? Does it feel like you're losing control? Introducing mSpy. mSpy is a highly advanced smartphone monitoring software that has been designed to help you mitigate risks at home or at work. Protect your kids and your loved ones from online and offline dangers. Track their location or restrict access to applications and websites Check their SMS and phone calls. 
MSPY lets you prevent risks of data leaks, monitor your employees, and keep track of their productivity in and out of the office. Surveillance is widespread in the corporate sector, with companies spying on customers, employees, and rivals. Sam Antar worked for an electronics chain known as Crazy Eddie, which was shut down by the federal government for corrupt practices. They were using surveillance gadgets as if they were their own NSA. My name is Sam Antar. I'm the former chief financial officer of a criminal enterprise known as Crazy Eddie's. I'm a former CPA, and I am a convicted felon. Today I advise law enforcement, colleges, universities about white collar crime. Sam, you know, the issue of surveillance is, has become a big issue, but it's not a new issue, really. What have been your experiences with the surveillance state that we live in? Back in my criminal days, it, let's put it this way, in every organization, whether it's a legitimate organization or a criminal organization, there are rivals vying for power. There are factions in every organization. In our criminal enterprise, which was Crazy Eddie's, my cousin Eddie used an Israeli security company to keep tabs on his rivals within the co-conspiracy. So everyone. In other words, there was no honor among thieves. Everyone was spying on everyone else. Yes. And this private surveillance, in a way, has been going on for a long time and is very pervasive. It's a big business. Yes. It's, it's a bigger story than the NSA story. It's really corporate surveillance of critics or corporate surveillance of rivals within their own corporations. In other words, executives surveilling rival executives. Perhaps that's why in our age of innovation, some engineers and tech geeks are designing a new NSA surveillance-free Internet. Physicists are using quantum physics to design one. Political leaders who've been spied on by the NSA, like leaders of Brazil and Germany, are encouraging this effort. Brazil believes that the governing of the Internet should be multi-sector, democratic and transparent. We consider the multilateral model to be the best way to govern it. My belief is when you're in a difficult situation, avoid the problem. Because sometimes you can't win every battle. And my belief is let's try and put our resources as corporations in the emerging sectors of the economies of the world where we're helping people with their needs and we're avoiding being part of a spy network that no matter how well-intentioned by some individual per people will end up in very mischievous uses. And we see this all over repeatedly in history. So when you can't win, run to a new corner and try and build something new. The new quantum computers may not be a panacea for privacy, says tech specialist and former military network administrator Brad Summerall. No, they got quantum computers coming out. And quantum computers are gonna change everything because then de uh, processing data is instantaneous in any amount. So this new technology that's coming down the pike is going to make surveillance and all the things we're talking about now even worse, possibly. Yep. A lot worse. A whole lot worse. This, do you feel that sometimes the system, you know, just goes off on its own? It's almost rogue. You can't control it? That's kind of what's going on now, especially with that Patriot Act still in effect. A lot of people have to understand that's what's doing the damage is that Patriot Act. <laughs> it is new. I mean, they've got, look, money is the driver here. You know, they've got money to do everything they want. If they want to snoop on their own people, they got money to do that. Congress is happy to appropriate money to places like NSA. But the stifling effect, now I ask you, what college graduate or uh, PhD is going to want to come down to Washington and to subject him or herself to this kind of Stasi type environment. I suggest to you that uh, they're going to get a bunch of people that I'd rather not see in the high positions of our security services. Philosophically, do we become uh, the people that we warned others about, like the Stasi of East Germany or the uh, KGB, or you know, have we turned into a surveillance state? Well, we have, but there's some good news, okay? The good news is this, that surveillance states can't operate without incredibly gifted, incredibly imaginative, incredibly smart people like Edward Snowden, okay? Now, if you only have one out of a hundred, or maybe even out of a thousand, technically proficient people like this, 
That's all you need to do what Edward Snowden did. So, the governments cannot operate without these very bright people. A lot of these bright people bring consciences to their expertise. As long as that's the case, and that will continue to be the case, uh, the governments will not be able to get away with this kind of thing. So that's the good news. The bad news, of course, is they'll keep trying. And uh, as I say, said before, with the executive, the legislative, and judicial branches of our government all kind of complicit in this, well, and then you have the media and the corporations and all that, it looks very much like the classic definition that Mussolini gave to fascism. And, you know, there's still a lot more to be discovered. I mean, because of Edward Snowden, we have access to an awful lot of information about an awful lot of programs, but it's not nearly the scope of all these programs. Plus, you have so many different agencies involved now. I think there are 16 different agencies that make up the, the intelligence com community, much less the, the multitude, the thousands of companies that are involved in this activity, both here in the U.S. and abroad. Not quite everywhere. In a report, Top Secret America, the Washington Post showed that there are 854,000 contractors with top secret clearances. Since 9-11, 33 new facilities were built or are being built. That's 17 million square feet. The bottom line seems to be that everyone is in the game as a very profitable surveillance industry expands beyond the limits of government and beyond the borders of countries. It's not a left-wing issue. It's not a right-wing issue per se. It's, it, it's a, it, it goes on everywhere in this world. People want to know about what they don't know about. And spy agencies play to that. Yes. NSA whistleblowers are hoping the public will get more engaged. What lessons can we learn from this whole sad saga, if you will, of an agency that seems to have gone rogue but has gotten more money and more legitimacy as it goes along? What's, the what's in the future for America if this continues at this le level? A police state. That's what you know, we're talking about. Right now, I think we're at the, the very beginnings of, of what I call police state light because the police state tries to hide what they're doing. They're very covert about their police state activities. And they deny it and they're lying about the, the fact that they do content. What right do we have as a country to engage in mass surveillance of other nation states? We don't. Remember, the sovereign rights that are granted all human beings extends beyond just the fact that you're an American citizen. That's all human beings. There is this American exceptionalism Somehow we're immune from history. I don't think so. All empires have ended up in the dustbin of history. It's very, but see, all empires, when they realize that they, or subconsciously realize they could end up in the dustbins of history, tend to project. They tend to compensate. And guess what they do? They increasingly militarize themselves. And that's precisely what is happening in this country. Let's give the last word to NSA whistleblower Edward Snowden, whose daring disclosures have forced us all to reflect on the dangers of a total surveillance society and turned the American surveillance state into a political battleground. To conclude, I'd like to remind you that even if these state surveillance programs were perfect, even if they were never abused, and even if the oversight failures that are all too common today were fixed. These programs have never been shown to be uniquely valuable in keeping us safe. And again, you don't have to take my word for it. Two independent White House panels with complete access to classified information found that these programs had never stopped a single imminent terrorist attack in the United States. So I would say, I would argue, I would submit to you that when all three branches of government agree that these programs must end, it seems clear to me that they're not a legitimate defense of our freedoms, but they are in fact a clear and present danger to both them and our way of life as Americans. America's Surveillance State was produced by Danny Schechter of Global Vision for Press TV.